thousands of years, wherever opium poppies have been grown or alcohol fermented, people have been conducting a vast, uncontrolled experiment on their own brains. And recently, with the invention of many new mind-altering substances, millions more, without knowing it, have become volunteers in that dangerous experiment. When I first attempted to stop taking sleeping tablets, I just stopped. And I felt so well for two or three days. And then on the fourth day, I suddenly thought I was climbing the walls. I just felt demented. I felt absolutely insane. I went out and I couldn't wait to get home. And it's as though my whole being was screaming. My body was screaming and my brain was screaming. I, I can't describe it any more than that. It was the worst thing I've ever experienced. This is Soho in London. All over the world, every big city has its equivalent of Soho, a place where people come to satisfy their appetites, to discover their needs, and to indulge their fantasies. The lust for pleasure is a powerful force in human nature. At its best, it lifts us above our animal instincts, turning the crude biological necessities of drinking, eating and sex into rituals of great beauty and social significance. But behind the exciting and socially acceptable exterior of every Soho is a back alley world of addiction in which pleasure has become a disease, a world of crack and smack and a growing catalogue of other chemicals that subvert the machinery for need and reward in our brains. Could it be that some drugs also have a direct line to the same brain areas that are active during the pleasures of sex, and perhaps the pleasures of eating and drinking too? Until recently, 60% of the world's illegal drugs have been consumed in the United States. That's why so much of the pioneering work in the biology and psychology of addiction has been done in America. Jim Sloan, his life shattered by drugs, will today help researchers in Philadelphia develop ways to rebuild his addict's mind. He's about to undergo a strange ordeal in a sealed chamber that will last nearly an hour. But how did he get in the fix he's in? Five years ago, Jim had only one drug problem. Uh, the only addiction that I had at the time was cigarettes, which had started at a very early age, and uh, didn't consider that an addiction until, like, later in my life. And when I considered it an addiction, I quit. It wasn't easy, but, you know, I'd been smoking 18 years, but I did manage to break the habit. Then cocaine came into Jim's life. I, was, I had an eye injury in the hospital, and uh, there was a large cash award. I uh, ended up with a little over $100,000. And uh, I was single, living by myself, going out with several friends who used cocaine. And I couldn't see the point in it. So, uh, you know, it was offered several times. And finally, I decided I would try it, basically, because I wanted to show how stupid it was to use $50 worth of cocaine for something that was going to last a few seconds. You, know, you can't make $50 in a few seconds. So I tried it, snorting it, and I didn't get anything at all out of it. So then it was presented to me that uh, maybe if you tried freebasing, you know, you'd, you'd get a different reaction. So about a week went by and got with the same group of people, and I tried freebasing for the first time. And it was a tremendous rush. It was like every pain, every ache in my body was gone. And it was like having an orgasm with every nerve ending in my body at the same time. It was like the sexual act magnified. And from that point on, I was a cocaine addict. A battle began between pleasure and punishment, chemical warfare, in the mind of Jim Sloan. The physical damage alone, uh, they're playing with death, you know. I've had sessions where I would fall out on the floor, my heart would be palpitating, you know, to a tremendous rate, and I would get very frightened that I was going to die. 
and I would, while I was laying there, swear to myself and to God that once it was passed, I wouldn't do this again. And I'd get right up off the floor, and five or ten minutes later, I'd be getting high again. Today, there is urgency in the scientific search for the brain circuits affected by drugs. In the last century, the search had hardly begun. In the latter part of the 19th century, we really weren't too concerned about addictions. The heroin that was available at the time was in many medicinals. And most of the users at that time were older people, middle-aged women, in fact, were the main users of heroin. There were two other groups of uh, heroin users in the latter part of the 19th century. One is the group we call the opium eaters. And these mainly were sort of the yuppies of the time. These were the people interested in the arts. And although it was frowned upon, people didn't pay too much attention to this. However, at the same time, we had people in the West Coast who were smoking opium. And a lot of people were very upset about this because the people smoking opium weren't the upper class. They were Chinese workers. And uh, the first punitive laws in this country against the use of drugs was against the Chinese in San Francisco in the 19th century. Now, at the same time that all this was happening, uh, Freud had discovered cocaine. Freud made a serious mistake. He thought that cocaine was a new wonder drug that could cure his patients of an addiction to opiate drugs, such as morphine or heroin. Time and again, new drugs have been thought not to be addictive. During the 30s and early 40s, amphetamine was uh, extensively used. During World War II, pilots uh, air crew members used amphetamine on long missions. It was only after the war that amphetamines were recognized as a serious problem. In the early 1950s, at the Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, Conan Kornetsky and his colleagues carefully recorded the effects of different drugs. When opiates are abruptly withdrawn after chronic administration, an abstinence or withdrawal syndrome emerges, indicating the development of physical dependence. He yawns and is restless, complains of aches and pains, and exhibits fever, goose flesh, excessive sweating and vomiting. The twitching in the legs has given rise to the expression, kicking the habit. Amphetamines, too, had bizarre effects. In this scene, the subject is chasing a non-existent butterfly through the air and catching it and handing it to the examiner. He then plucks insects from the skin of his arm. But the psychiatric treatment used at the time failed to help these addicted patients. Well, I became concerned by the fact that it didn't seem like we were doing very much for these people. I became aware that maybe we were not looking at the proper measure. We really should be looking at why are these drugs reinforcing, why are they rewarding, why do they produce pleasurable effects? Well, about that time in the early 50s, uh, Heath in Louisiana reported some interesting studies in man suggesting that there might be some sort of pleasure area in the brain. You almost look like you're smiling a bit. Are you? Oh, no, I might. Bob Heath implanted electrodes in the brains of chronically depressed patients, hoping to stimulate pleasurable sensations. I guess I've cracked up all the way, I don't know. You mean that's when you're smiling? Probably. Well, you Nighty like you really... <laughs> what are you laughing about? I don't know. Huh? What do you mean? Are you doing something to me? Not surprisingly, the experiments were controversial. But the electrodes did have an effect, especially near an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Heath even let his patients control their own stimulation. I find this button the best. That's the number most, two button. Most pleasurable. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you feel? Oh, I think it's kind of a, I think it's somewhat of a sexy button. Yeah. Is that why you said it went all the way down? Perhaps we get pleasure from drugs because they stimulate the same brain areas as sex and food. Like Bob Heath's patients, I can tell you about the emotions that I feel, like the pleasures of eating, for instance. But to find out about the brain mechanisms involved, experiments on animals were essential. In Montreal, in the 1950s, 
James Olds put electrodes into the brains of laboratory rats. But how could he tell whether they liked the stimulation? This is a device which trains the animal to turn on the stimulus for himself. Here you notice the animal wandering toward the pedal. When he first touches it, he gets no stimulation. It's not connected yet. Then one time he touches the pedal, it does turn on the stimulation. You can see the lights go on. Now the interesting thing about the old stimulation, the rewarding stimulation, was the strength of it. It was somewhat different than rewarding stimulation for food and water in that there was no satiation. Animals would continue for hours and hours and didn't seem to satiate. They didn't feel full. They would just keep doing it for long, long periods of time. They would do it to exhaustion. Now, I will electrify the grid. The animal must cross an area that gives a very painful shock to the feet in order to get to the pedal and stimulate the brain. And a rat wanting brain stimulation would brave a shock stronger than even a starving rat would brave to get food. This shows a rat is willing to pay a very high price in order to get to the pedal. Human addicts will pay just as high a price for their rewards. Everything is about getting high. And any means necessary to get there becomes rational. If it means stealing something from somebody close to you, then you'll do that. Um, if it means lying to your family, uh, uh, borrowing money from people you know you can't pay back, writing checks you know you can't cover, you know, you do all of those things. And uh, if you're sitting around a table freebasing, it's five people freebasing, one of them falls out on the floor and dies, you don't call for help because that's more cocaine for the rest of them. Kornetsky realized that drugs and electrical stimulation might act together on a system of pleasure in the brain. The fascinating thing was that we found in our laboratory that every single drug that increased sensitivity of the animal to brain stimulation was either an abuse substance or a substance that has potential for abuse. So James Old's technique of the 50s gave scientists a way of testing for the addictive potential of drugs. Right, right there. There's a circuitry. And a way to find out where in the brain they acted. Now, I think there's general agreement that this is the area where the action is in terms of the rewarding effects of drugs. Whether they be heroin, whether they be amphetamine, whether they be cocaine or angel dust or whatever, that, where any drug that produces rewarding effects, it's believed this is where the action is. Using similar methods, Chris Fibiger and his colleagues in Vancouver wanted to know which pleasure areas are common to the craving for both drugs and food. They found that the area Heath stimulated in his patients, the nucleus accumbens, is the focus of a key network, the dopamine circuit. Heroin acts on one part of the circuit. Cocaine on another. So both affect the nucleus accumbens, which the Canadian scientists recently proved is also active when we crave food. If we selectively take these dopamine neurons out of that part of the brain, the animal loses interest in self-administering cocaine, it seems. Uh, there's apparently the drug is no longer reinforcing. The same story seems to apply for amphetamine. If you destroy these dopamine-containing neurons in the nucleus accumbens, amphetamine self-administration uh, disappears as well. I think this approach is going to be able to tell us something about how the human mind works in the sense that what is it that causes feelings of pleasure, feelings of sadness, depression, euphoria, all of these things are processes that take place probably involving these reward circuits that we're looking at. Suddenly, we see a link between the drugs of addiction and natural, but powerful mechanisms for the regulation of hunger, thirst, and the urge for sex. But the drugs can gain an evil grip on the brain by breaking the normal, self-regulating cycle of need, 
action and satisfaction. A heroin addict has volunteered to be given a large dose of morphine, chemically similar to heroin, by scientists at the National Institute for Drug Abuse in Baltimore. At last, new machines Relax. allow us to look in at the living human brain. Keep your eyes closed. Have a laser shine. They reveal that drugs act on systems that were established long ago in our primitive animal past. Morphine shuts down the higher cortex and leaves the older emotional brain in charge. Cocaine gives a boost to the whole brain, but especially stimulates the primitive centers of emotion. So, starting from those rough and ready experiments in the 1950s, scientists have learned where in the brain many addictive drugs act, but not precisely how they act. <laughs> hmm? What in the hell are you doing? <laughs> huh? what do you then, mean, what are we doing? in the 1960s, came the Vietnam War. That <laughs> <laughs> I this is this is probably all SIDS and we're getting busted, but okay. I don't care. Shut <laughs> down. Well, it, it was awesome. Can you get him back here? Okay, can you get him back here, though? Remember I mean, it was daily for me to see somebody limbs blown off, decapitated, cut all up. I, I just hate to think about it. I mean, I just had to be sedated on something. We spotted a ghoul. I really and truly can say, if it wasn't for Vietnam, oh, I would have never been on heroin, hard drugs. One good thing came out of that wretched war. It gave new impetus to scientific research. Opium is an age-old drug, and heroin was already well established in the subculture of the American streets. But here was a whole generation of clean-cut American boys out in Vietnam hooked on these deadly narcotics. Now, scientists have been interested in addiction for years, but suddenly it became a political issue. And the American government, terrified about addiction in Vietnam, started to pump money into research. And they gave it at just the right time. The Vietnam grants went to researchers who were beginning to find out just how nerve cells communicate with each other. A chemical released by one cell stimulates receptor sites on the next cell. Heroin, morphine, and the other opiates also act on a specific class of receptor molecules in the membranes of nerve cells in the brain. But it was one man, more than any other, who saw the implications of this. An emigre from Germany, Hans Kostelitz, working at the University of Aberdeen, was more than 70 when he decided that the world was ready for his extraordinary idea that the brain might manufacture its own morphine. One day, when I, I was working in the laboratory, and one of my young students came to see me, and then he asked me, now, why do you do that? Why are you interested in morphine and, and things? Why? Obviously, we all know something about it. I hesitated. I didn't want to say what I really thought, but. This young man forced me and I said, well, you know, if you keep it to yourself and don't tell anybody, then I have a suspicion there may be a morphine-like substance in the, in the brain. Now, that was in the early 60s. And in 1972, Hans Kostelitz did a simple but crucial experiment. He knew that morphine could slow down the contractions of some types of muscle. So he concentrated an extract from hundreds of pig brains and applied it to tiny strips of muscle. It had precisely the same effect as morphine. The extract must contain a morphine-like substance produced naturally by nerve cells in the brain. Yes. 
the brain's own morphine, heroin. The active parts of both molecules are the same shape, so they work on the same receptor. That's why an extract from a poppy can affect the brain. Morphine, opium and heroin unlock a chemical system used by the brain itself. Well, which is the crucial part then? This is the crucial part because that differentiates between methionine and caffeine and and caffeine. Yes, yes, but the whole so molecule is presumably of significance. The whole molecule is of significance, yeah. particularly this end, of course, if you lose that, you don't get any action at all. Yes. Hans Kostelitz and John Hughes, then a student, discovered that there are two forms of their peptide molecule enkephalin made and secreted by nerve cells in the brain. The enkephalins may play a part in the regulation of pain, hence the pain-killing effects of morphine. And we now know that there are at least a dozen other similar substances made by the brain. They play a part in the regulation of blood pressure, body temperature, and many other vital processes. This class of substances so closely related to deadly drugs are essential for normal life. While the actions of the old opiate drugs were helping to reveal the chemistry of the mind, a new generation of psychoactive substances was being developed. In the respectable suburbs of the Western world, the vast, uncontrolled experiment took a new turn. In the 1960s came the tranquilizers Librium and Valium, they were prescribed to millions. I was first prescribed tranquilizers because I was very depressed and under a lot of stress. My marriage was breaking down and I had just had our second child. Nobody said anything about being depressed because I just had a baby. I just simply went to my doctor and said, I'm very, very depressed. And she assumed I couldn't cope and gave me tranquilizers. For 20 years, Lisa was given various versions of these drugs. At the peak, 15% of the population in Europe and America was taking them. At first, they were not thought to be addictive. I had three attempts at stopping to take my sleeping tablets, and I was so ill when I stopped that I would start taking them again. I didn't know how to stop. I suspected they were making me ill. But at the same time, I'd come to believe that I was a totally inadequate person who, without these sleeping tablets, would become such a burden. I went to the drawer and I looked at them and I said, I haven't seen you for so long. Let me look at you. Let me take you out and let me feel you. And, and I thought, Oh, my God, I'm an addict. I'm, I'm an absolute addict. The tranquilizers Lisa was taking are called benzodiazepines. In London, pharmacologist John Littleton believes that these drugs may have a similar effect to that of alcohol on brain cells. I was struck by the fact that a large proportion of the patients we were treating were alcoholics and that there was really very little we could do for them and there was very little understanding of the kind of changes that happened in brain uh, as a result of long-term administration of drugs, including alcohol, but also including things like benzodiazepines. Hello, Joyce, what have we got here today? Here's our caraffin cells, looking quite good, looking Sure. OK. We were interested in the way in which alcohol affected nerve cells, particularly because uh, nerve cells, nerve cell excitability is inhibited by alcohol and this probably results in the intoxication that one gets with alcohol. Now other drugs probably also inhibit nerve cell excitability but nerve cells in different parts of the brain so that for example morphine will produce a loss of pain sensation and will produce euphoria but the actual effect on the nerve cell is probably a reduction in the excitability of the nerve cell. And what we found is that in the continued presence of alcohol, we think the nerve cells adapt so that their excitability uh, regains its normal level. The membranes of nerve cells contain calcium channels through which electric charge can enter the cell. Littleton believes that the chronic use of tranquilizers or alcohol shuts down these channels. So the cell compensates by making more. <laughs> 
When the drug or alcohol is stopped, both old and new channels can operate, so the nerve cell overreacts, producing the painful symptoms of withdrawal. I would experience electric shocks going all over my body, and my skin felt as I'd been scalded with hot water. I felt as though my body was was actually falling apart, that my leg, my arms and legs would come off and that my chest would, would just fall open. I felt as though my brain was clogged up with the debris and the dead stuff from tranquilizers and sleeping tablets. So when I stopped taking them, it was as though my thought processes were rivers and there were thousands and thousands of these. And some were still blocked and the water couldn't get through. And some were flooding and some were, were crossing over and there was so much thought, there were so many thought processes forming a sort of river and it was, it was crazy. I couldn't cope with it. It was, it was insanity. We think that this change in the number of calcium channels may be a common mechanism which underlies the development of physical dependence on drugs which depress the nervous system. And by drugs which depress the nervous system, I mean alcohol, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and morphine. So because of Vietnam, researchers have made crucial progress in understanding the effects of drugs on nerve cells. But the war experience was to deliver another extraordinary surprise. In the early 70s, the men addicted in Vietnam started to come home. Lee Robbins was asked to follow them up. The Veterans Administration was extremely concerned because the men were being sent back from Vietnam and they thought that their services would be absolutely flooded with people requiring drug services, which they didn't have. There was also a lot of public fear in terms of what it would mean to the public to have all of these addicts coming back to the United States, presumably robbing people and killing people in order to get money for drugs. The problem in Vietnam was that drugs were extremely cheap, particularly heroin, and so that ordinary enlisted men had been able to use it quite freely and to afford it. Rang it bang, get your hair cut. <laughs> Vietnam veterans get together at Danny Miller's bar in South St. Louis. Nearly everyone here used drugs in Vietnam. Everybody. And, I mean, I was in a company of 158 men. One guy in that company didn't use drugs. Just one. That was the only thing you could do that made you relax. It made you not just walk around like this all the time. But the findings of Lee Robbins' large-scale study came as a shock to addiction researchers. To our great delight and to the government's great surprise, we found that most of these men had very little trouble with drugs after they got back. I didn't have any trouble with drugs when I got home. None whatsoever. I got home and I was, I was in fine shape. People were very curious about how this could happen. It so violated all their expectations. And one of the commonest beliefs was, after the fact, that the reason was that these men had become addicted in one environment and then had moved to another environment and that they couldn't get drugs easily in the States and that had explained the, the change. Well, we explored that in a number of ways. In the first place, we asked them if they knew where to get heroin if they wanted it in the States, and 85% of them said yes. We also found that a great many of them had indeed tried heroin again after they came back. About half of all the addicts actually went back to heroin, tried it, and still didn't get addicted. But a few did remain addicted after Vietnam. What makes some people more vulnerable than others? One of the possibilities is that these men are genetically different, that some people have a much greater liability, much more likely to become addicted if they get exposed to sufficient heroin. We don't have much information about genetic factors because this is a new epidemic. None of the parents of these people have ever been exposed to illicit drugs, and certainly not to heroin. We have found that antisocial behavior in parents and alcohol dependence in parents uh, are related to the use of drugs in young people and perhaps to the 
a continuation into addiction. Because alcohol has been around for so long, freely available, legally and socially acceptable, it's the only addictive drug for which we have enough information to be able to follow the pattern of its use from generation to generation. That pattern suggests that alcoholism is at least partly inherited. My grandfather was a heavy drinker, and I was told that my father was a heavy drinker, but I don't know. Uh, my mother and father separated when I was about four and a half years old. The first time I drank, I drank a, a fifth of whiskey, and uh, I really liked it, you know, the high, the, the giggles, and just enjoyed it. Uh, on the way home, I got sick, and uh, I didn't care too much for that, you know, and I thought, this, this is crazy. But then again, the very next night, I'd done the same thing. You know, uh, I can look back on this experience now, you know, and I knew that I drank alcoholically from the start. Al has a type of alcoholism that seems to be passed from father to son. But is there any way to find out if the child of an alcoholic has inherited his parents' susceptibility? Recently, Al came to Brooklyn to take a new kind of test. Henri Begleiter studies brain deficits in alcoholics. There are a number of deficits. In fact, one of the most remarkable findings of our long-term investigations is the fact that we found deficits almost every place we looked. We found sensory deficits. We found the deficits in very primitive areas of the brain, such as the brainstem, for instance. And uh, more recently, in the last 10 years, we have uncovered a number of deficits in abstinent alcoholics in cognition. The technique for attaching electrodes to his scalp is quite painless. Al hasn't had a drink for six years. But will the test still reveal abnormalities in his brain? I'm uh, Dr. Begleider. How are you? How are you today? Hi. All right. We need to see if we can test you, if you'll accompany us to the chamber Hello. here. Are you going to press this button whenever you hear the low tone? Uh, the one on the left. Yes. Okay. okay put the Al's on. behavior now seems normal. But Begleiter's test will show if Al's brain fails to respond normally to new stimuli. Okay. In normal people, about a third of a second after an unexpected sound or a changed image, a wave of electrical activity called the P3 wave sweeps across the brain. This P3 is often much reduced in alcoholics. Will Al's brain show the telltale deficit? This person is producing another alpha. Computer analysis isolates the P3 waves in brain cross sections. On this side, we have enlarged the display of the normal control. And what you see here is a rather large area which indicates that P3 is very strong in voltage in this normal control. This is manifested by this large red spot, which is located toward the back of the head. On the other hand, if you look at the topogram, which we obtained from Al, you can see that the P3 is totally absent in this area of the brain. Indeed, you can see the difference is rather striking between the P3 distribution here and the absence of any P3 voltage on this side. And the crucial question, is this the effect of years of alcohol or the sign of a tr true genetic trait? Okay. Begleiter's team has been testing young boys who probably have never had a drink. Keep your eyes focused straight ahead. This boy's brain shows no P3 deficit, but he doesn't have alcoholic parents. Now a boy who does have an alcoholic father. The P3 is missing, just as in Al's brain. Our hope is that this deficit can be construed as a valid and reliable biological marker for subsequent alcohol abuse.
so perhaps some children could be warned of the special risk they may run if they start drinking, the risk of addiction. I started getting real depressed. Uh, I think basically I wanted to drink, but I didn't want to drink. I knew that if I kept on with, in that depression, that eventually I was going to die. You know, I would eventually kill myself. You know, I knew I had to go somewhere. I knew I had to get out of that depression. Alcoholics Anonymous helped Al to kick his habit, and now there are many other sorts of self-help groups supporting addicts as they try to escape from their cravings. And what they're discovering is something that was already known from experiments on animals in the laboratory, that the desire for a drug or a habit can be triggered by other things in the environment. The sight of a bar, the smell of cigarette smoke, the packaging and the paraphernalia for taking a drug. Well, it's just like, I guess, you know, alcoholic has to walk down the street and, and pass a bar without getting a craving for a drink. Uh, drugs are everywhere, especially, in, you know, where I live, in areas that I have to travel through. You have people standing on the corner selling drugs openly, calling you from your, from, you know, if you drive by, they, they stop your car and offer you different things. Your approach, sometimes with free drugs, you know, they try to steer you into a... a a uh, situation where uh, something's going to trigger you and get you started again. There's a lot of triggers, a tremendous amount of triggers. One of them is, is a, a sum of money. If you get your hands on 20 or $50 at one time, that's a hit. There are other things, like um, if you see some of the paraphernalia involved, um, the smell of matches that, that you use when you're freebasing. Somebody lights a cigarette around you, you might start thinking about getting high. Today, Jim is going to the Veterans Administration Hospital in Philadelphia, where the researchers want to know if he can still resist his triggers. Jim is being exposed to the most intense triggers, while his breathing, heart rate and skin temperature are measured. Okay, Jim, are you feeling any high, one to 10? One. Are you feeling any withdrawal or crash symptoms, one to 10? One. His body and mind are being made to unlearn some of his own particular triggers. Okay, Jim, we're ready for today's drug preparation. If you'd be good enough to open the box and continue, please, up to the point of inhalation. Finally, he actually has to prepare to freebase cocaine. You'll get into uh, actual ritual of getting high without getting high. You'll cook up cocaine, you'll put it in a pipe as if you're going to smoke it, and then they'll take it from you. You'll go through this ritual like three times in a row, and then you'll watch a tape, and then you'll do it again. And uh, after doing that, over a period of time, you get desensitized to the point where you can handle these things without the craving because you know you're not going to complete the act. This was how his body reacted five months ago. His body temperature dropped very sharply in anticipation of the drug to come. And today? Okay, he's still breathing a little more deeply, but the mm -hmm. respiration is regular. And the temperature is holding steady, mm -hmm. 97. No drop at all. When he did his first cook-up, his temperature dropped into the upper 70s. So he's still above 95. Significant improvement. It's taken 20 sessions to suppress Jim's physiological responses. Maybe now he can resist his triggers. I feel extremely hopeful that this kind of work is sort of a step it's, it's not the end point, because we have a lot more to learn about chemical interventions. There may be things that are important, but at this stage of the knowledge, being able to do an intervention like this and buy a patient some drug-free time is crucial, because prevention of relapse is really where it's at at this point. What I'm trying to find out is, do you think that the mechanical drawing... Now Jim is getting back with his family. 
It would be wonderful to have magic. Um, at this point, we settle for little bits of magic. And when someone has 14 months of abstinence after 17 years of continuous drug use, for me, that's a good piece of magic. Hello, Colin. Hey, Jeffrey. Nice. How are you? Jeffrey Gray from oh, the Institute of Psychiatry is an old friend who's an expert in the field of addiction. I wanted to ask you about the work which you've been doing, rather like that of the, the Philadelphia group on treating addicts. He too yes. is trying to decondition addicts, but he's extending his research beyond the hospital setting. But then after we've uh, eliminated the responses to certain stimuli on the ward, we then accompany the patient out into his normal environment. We go with him to the places where he used to procure the drug or where he used to take the drug, and we try and eliminate his responses also to th those particular environments. And this way we hope to eventually uh, reduce the chance that the environmental cues will start him off taking his drugs again. The problem, I guess, may be that the cravings are so strong for some people that they just come back after your treatment. Uh, it's so difficult. You're not there with them when they take up the drug again. Uh, we certainly know, for example, that in many patients, the particular cues that trigger drug taking are internal. They're things like feeling depressed, feeling angry. What you find is that the pattern of craving can be very idiosyncratic. Uh, some individuals will have a particular response to a particular stimulus and another individual to a completely different stimulus, which is what you'd expect because they've had different experiences in their lives. Lisa Harrison developed her own individual method of unlearning her habit. I realize now I was so addicted to my capsule that I wanted to stay with that until the bitter end. I didn't want to swap over to a green pill or a white pill. I wanted my capsule. She devised a very special way to cut down her dose. It just fell into place somehow. It was special having a piece of gold card and having a rather ornate glass ashtray. It, it, it reinforced the ritual of the whole thing. As I was coming off, I began to realize more and more that I was enjoying the ritual of cutting down and the pre precision it involved, the, the steady hand and getting the exact amount. And when one is addicted, one has to get the last little bit off into the back into the capsule all this came into the sort of undoing process um, a retrograde addiction process somehow and all this ritual certainly seems to have helped things are 100% better than they were six months ago and I've been off now for one year so things have progressively opened up for me my mind is opening up my visions opening up my ears are opening up my intelligence is opening up I just can't begin to explain it to anybody Jeffrey there are so many different drugs of addiction I, I think I understand how the opiate things work morphine and, and, uh, and opium itself and so on acting on on receptors in, in the reward system of the brain but does everything act the same way what about benzodiazepines for instance well there are similarities in the different addictions but there are also major differences and I think you have to be clear about that as you said uh, things like cocaine and heroin they seem principally to work on what you might call the reward system in the brain that's a system where the principal pathway consists of dopamine cell bodies down here in the brain stem mm -hmm. and these project to the area known as the nucleus accumbens and release of dopamine there is critical for the central mechanisms that mediate reward okay that's where heroin and cocaine for example principally work but the brain's also got a punishment mechanism a system which responds to threat by halting behavior which is faced with that threat it's it's an adaptive mechanism just like the reward mechanism is but it's quite different these two mechanisms, the reward and the punishment mechanism, are connected with each other so that when activity in the reward mechanism is high, it tends to suppress the action of the punishment mechanism and vice versa. When the punishment mechanism is active, you get a suppression of behavior motivated for rewards. Now, where the benzodiazepines almost certainly get their addictive potential from is that they suppress the punishment mechanism. 
that's felt subjectively as a reduction in, ang in anxiety. And that's why people take the benzodiazepines. It's often why they take alcohol. Alcohol is a more complex drug, but at least part of its action undoubtedly comes from its suppression of anxiety through the punishment mechanism of the brain, rather than through a direct action on the reward pathways. But do you think that th these drugs that act on the punishment mechanism have, have broken open? open a, a loop, a normal loop of, of, of need and satiation, we, we, like the, 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 uh, the opiate drugs on the, on the reward system? Yes, I think that's a, that's, that's a good point. You, you, in, in both cases, the brain obviously has got basic adaptation built into it. The reward mechanism is there to get at the things that you need, like food and water and sex. And the thing about cocaine, for example, is that it directly acts on that mechanism so that it bypasses all of the normal feedback which allows us to get the things we need. It just gives you a, an immediate central reward. Similarly, a punishment mechanism has as its objective to cause the individual to develop coping behavior that prevents it prevents you from getting into trouble. If you use drugs which immediately reduce that central state of anxiety, you don't develop the coping behavior. So these two systems in the brain, the reward system and the punishment system, are so central so, to so much of what we do normally, and their control can be taken over in all sorts of odd ways, in, in, in behaviors that we would call addictive or unusual. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, we have these powerful mechanisms in the brain that are there to get us to the good things of life, the things we need, and to keep us out of trouble, the bad things of life, but you can pervert their mechanism of action. You can do it by drugs that get right into the brain. You can do it by strange uh, behavioral experiences which lead to gambling or fetishism and that sort of thing. But in the end, everything's got to come back to, way, to the way those reward and punishment mechanisms work. I still crave. Um, I find that really bewildering when it happens because it's totally irrational can look at a tablet and think this is going to make me ill it won't even put me back where I was you know I can't take one and be in the even in the state of mind I was in a year ago and yet I crave it yet I imagine what it would be like to take a Valium but have to talk myself right out of it instantly but this is this really frightens me this addiction is stronger than I am in a sense Our brains are designed to make us creatures of habit, but drugs have a chemical hot line that gives pleasure without fulfillment. The mind of an addict is a changed mind. Some can fight their addiction, a battle of will against chemical warfare, but science can't yet tell us who can win and who will lose. That vast, uncontrolled experiment on the streets of the world is gathering pace. To tinker with the delicate mechanism of need and reward bequeathed to us by evolution is a dangerous gamble with the gift of the freedom of choice.